is extremely intuitive. It might seem why are we even bothering to learn about how to visualize data. In fact, we've been doing this since the day you were born, visualizing information and taking in gigabytes and gigabytes of information every minute through your eyes. And our human brain is incredibly good at sorting out your visual information. But the purpose of this class is to show you a few examples of good visualization and bad visualization. So you understand what we're looking for and how we can efficiently and quickly get to the data. Okay, so we take in large quantities of data very efficiently as humans through our, our, through our eye. Rather than looking at numeric tables, we, we like to tend and we tend to plot our data up and we can get to our data far quicker that way. So the purpose here is to introduce a few different ways you can look at the same data set. For the same data set, you can plot a time series plot, a bar plot, box plots, and scatter plots if you've got two variables. But um, the purpose here is to introduce the theory and the behind each one, I'll show you some good and bad examples. So some typical ways you can use this is if you've got a, a reactor, a batch, or a continuous, it doesn't matter what, but at the end of the day, you generate some data from that system. You can calculate at the end of the day the yield that you achieved. So what is your efficiency at which you convert your raw materials over to final products, so the yield? And you've got that, that yield value for the last three years, one data point every day. How can you summarize those 1,256 odd data points? We'll, we can look at them, say, as a histogram. Um, or as a time series plot and see some interesting trends of, in those data. So this, that's a typical, typical case that you will use almost right away. You'll go to a database in your company and you'll look at the previous performance of how your system has been working. Or this second example was uh, when I worked with Alcoa a few years ago, they had their product being produced on their line and they produced defective slabs of material from time to time. So at the end of the, at the, end of the run, some person is looking at the slab and classifying the types of defects that they see on it. Not most of it is, is defect-free. The reason why we want to summarize that defect history is we need to have a budget from our manager. Our manager says, look, here's $200,000, target the most common defects, or the defects that will get us the most return on our investment for that $200,000. So, Targeting the defect that appears most frequently is not necessarily the one that's going to get you the greatest return on investment. But we can look and summarize our data in tabular form, or as bar plots, or as histograms, or as a Pareto plot, and look at different ways we could spend that budget efficiently. Tiffany was a student in 2010 in this class, and she phoned me up uh, just during the summer time, I think it was, or no, actually it was last term, during the midterm in October on a Thursday, and she had a whole lot of data uh, which in her company where they classified various forms of scrap that are produced. And uh, over a few months, the manager had looked at the total scrap and said, look, there's something wrong here. We're producing far more scrap than we've done in the past. And she'd asked Tiffany then to look and investigate and find what the scrap causes were. <laughs> Tiffany phoned me, and she looked at the data already in numerical forms and some of the other tools that we use later in this course. But one thing that she hadn't done was actually efficiently find the data. So we spoke over the phone for an hour or two. She described the data to me. I suggested some, some plot that she look at, some time series plots. And she presented that to her manager on Friday morning. And Friday afternoon, she phoned me and said, that really saved us. Like we really got to the bottom of the problem and figured out what was the major cause of the, of the, of the scrap. And it turned out it was related to um, operators that had just recently been hired and hadn't been trained properly on how to deal with the product. So they noticed that the scrap spikes occurred at the same time the operators were hired. Another example of a system that generates huge amounts of data, and you will see this um, in many of you will work in systems where there's batch processes. So now a batch process looks like as follows. Here's a schematic on the left-hand side where we've charged our reactor with various reagents, water, and so forth. And we've got one particular measurement down here, X1 measuring the weight of the reactor. So we're measuring these variables, the weight of the reactor, for example, the amounts charged, pHs, temperatures, dissolved oxygen. Various variables are being measured over time. That batch runs for a certain horizon, five hours, 24 hours. Sometimes these batches run for three or four months. They're incredibly 
intensive and long duration batches in, in certain bioreactions. We're generating for every single one of these variables, I've got 14 variables on this, we call these tags. For every one of these tags or every one of these measurements, we're collecting data at a certain frequency, maybe once every five seconds, every 10 seconds, and in these long systems that go for three, four months, we only collect the data, say, once every minute. So here's an example of, of such a system here on the right. There you can see the top of the reactor and a few probes entering the red. Um, there's the motor, two old digital computers that are collecting and archiving the data for us. So this is what the data looks like from one batch. Here's a batch that will last for 325 minutes. It goes through three stages. In the first stage, the tank level, it slowly fills up. So between minute zero and 175, we're filling up that tank. So that's that trajectory. That's one of the variables. One of the other variables, for example, is the dryer's temperature and the dryer temperature set point and the agitator speed. So here in the first stage, the agitator's off. It's just a flat line step over there. Or um, not necessarily off, I think it's at 8 RPA. So just constant, constant speed agitation during the first stage. Stage two, we start to add some energy into the system. We get this temperature ramp going up. And then stage three, we've got the, the shutdown. So for a 25 minute period, 75 minute period, we're slowly just adding the system down. So that's data from one batch. It's about two, three megabytes in size. We've got data from multiple batches over many, many years. And if we start to superimpose them, we see these sorts of plots as shown on the right hand side. These are very effective visualization plots. We get a sense of the durations of the batch. Some batches last as short as 100 minutes, others go up to 180 minutes. Why is that? Here for this system, the operators have tremendous flexibility to run the speed of the batch. We can see some interesting events here. Here's a batch that had a malfunction in the collected tank level. It was up and then has this drop down. So very quickly we can pick up some of the unusual batches. Now, we don't look at this data in this course too much because this is a very complex multivariate data set. There's very effective multivariate data analysis methods to deal with these types of data, which will pick up far more sensitive uh, problems with the batches. But for a start, this is an excellent way to preview the fairly large data sets that you would, that you would typically get. Okay. Now, if you're, so that, that just gives you a sense of where we're going. If you're looking for more information on effective plots, there's a set of books here by Edward Tuffy, who's written some really good visual, you know, illustrated, visually illustrated books that show very good, bad, and bad plots. William Cleveland is another well-known researcher in the area of data visualization, as well as Stephen Pugh. And then here's just an interesting article on why Excel produces really essentially called chart junk. Um, basically useless plots that don't really help us visualize information. So, as I said at the beginning, this class seems easy, seems obvious. Why are we bothering with this? Um, as I've said, our eyes are incredibly good pattern recognition measures. Since the day we were born, we're taking in gigabytes of information. If I have to quantify the volume of data that my eye is taking in in terms of pixels, it's literally gigabytes per minute that's being processed through my brain. And that's just a natural, that's just a natural phenomenon that's occurred and how we've survived as humans over the many, many years. As John McGregor uh, says, he uses this analogy, the people who are not able to quickly and visually process information, those are the cavemen that are going to be eaten by the lions. Right? So we have to evolve over time to take in this visual information and process it very rapidly because our survival is dependent on it. So we've become very good at looking at bad plots. We can quickly pick up information even in a bad plot, but it takes more work. So for those of you who were in the 4N course, remember we did the BP case study where the operators really did not have effective visualizations on their control charts in the uh, control room. This is one way, one place where we as engineers can bring some of these tools and use them very effectively. Putting effective control charts into a control room that allows operators to very quickly understand what the data is doing. I'm having to look at a messy plot, or worse, no plot at all. 
But if we have an excellent plot that shows a clear picture of what's going on, those operators can then act quickly and act accurately on the problem. Okay? So what we're going to look at then is some examples of this in the next few slides. The first one we're going to consider is the most common plot you will see, especially in the control room, and that's a time series plot. All these plots we'll look at initially are two-dimensional in the sense that there's an x and y axis, but they're univariate plots. So there's two dimensions, but one of the dimensions is, is the variable of interest, usually the y axis. And then in a time series plot, our x axis is the time scale. So in those batch plots I had earlier, if I look just at one of these trajectories, say this dark line, the temperature, uh, the tank level, it's a univariate plot. My x-axis is time, my y-axis is the variable's value. So it's a univariate plot in the active space. So showing one variable at a time. I just happen to superimpose four, four variables on that plot. We can very quickly pick out unusual shapes and trends in that plot. So I, as I said, our eyes are very good pattern recognition engines. We pick out sinusoid spikes, outliers, very, very quickly we can distinguish what's noise and what's the actual signal in that, in that plot. So here's an example of a very bad plot I found on the internet when I was, a few years ago, when I was setting up this, this, uh, this section of the course. It shows the temperature of a CPU that some person has set up a system to automatically record and then plot this temperature of the CPU over time. A number of bad issues about this plot. Firstly, is this ridiculous x-axis. Saturday, Saturday at midnight, 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 midnight occurring. There's no sense of when this occurred ever. And I don't know if this was 20, 2008, 2012. When, when did this occur? So there's very little helpful information on that x-axis. You might, not, might as well not have that there. The y-axis is OK, though what I would suggest one do to improve this plot is really clip off this and this 40 to 35. We don't need this, this white space that's wasted over here. Another issue with the plot is the poor use of color. Red with very, very light green. It's incredibly hard to see even <coughs> people who are not color white. Um, this is an incredibly difficult color scheme to work through. So the use of color is very poor in this particular plot. And then secondly, I thought thirdly then is this is the trend shown. Now we do pick up as, as humans the fact that it's relatively constant temperature up till this particular Saturday at midnight, and then it drops down over time. So, so we, we can pick up that information from that noise. But there's a whole lot of noise here that's very, very useless to us. So to improve this plot, several, several things can be done. One is tightening up that y-axis, improving the x-axis, delete the use of color, Delete the use of the actual values. We don't really need all this dither around here. We can simply use a smooth value that shows essentially a straight line dropping off. And if we really want to superimpose some of that noise, that dither around there, that shows the variability temperature, we could use error, error bars above and below to give us bounds on, on that. So, so the very poor time series plot here in this case. Unfortunately, this is the sort of default <coughs> output that you get from most plotting software. So if you took this raw data, put it into Excel or Numbers or whatever your, your, um, your application is that you use to plot, MATLAB or Python, you would get something that looks like this. Um, you have to work quite hard at improving the visualization for this plot. Here's another guideline. If you're plotting multiple trajectories over time, one rule of thumb is to avoid having those trajectories cross and jumble each other, especially when there's noise or multiple movements in that, in that data. So here I've, I've taken three variables. What is the relationship between those variables? with the blue and green, it's moving, so when one is up, it's down. 
Now, it's, it's obvious when you, when you hear it, it takes a few seconds to see it, but it's, it's certainly not a helpful plot to quickly get to seeing that information. If I thin out the lines and I use a few markers, I thin out the markers as well, we improve some of that contrast there and we're able to see it a bit more clearly over there. But one way to more effectively see that is to use separate parallel axes when we've got overlapping lines. So I'm not saying it's a definite thing to always split out onto three axes. It's sometimes very effective to overlap on the same axis. I did that, for example, here in these um, batch plots. It's very effective to overlay the trajectories. But I've got four trajectories. I don't have a whole lot of markers. I don't have a whole lot of jumbles. So it's easy for me now to see that that the relationship between these variables plotted and the different phases, I'm getting useful information. But in this plot, when I'm overlaying it, it's very hard to get to the information. If I split it out, I can see those correlated trends far more clearly in these split out axes. Now it takes a while to get that set up. <coughs> I spent about 10 minutes tweaking with the various software settings to get a more effective visualization. Even more effective still is what are called spark lines. So spark lines are a very compact representation of time series data without the x-axis. So a spark line essentially takes the movement, that same plot that I had previously, we show that y-axis is implicit, the x-axis of time is implicit, we don't show that, but we very quickly get a sense of this negative correlation between variable b and c how they are oppositely correlated with each other. Okay. So this is a tool that's fairly standard now in some of the newer packages. Excel <coughs> 2010 has it built in. It's a great, great tool to have in a very compact display. So iPod, cell phones, tablet computers, these are great tools to visualize data. Why, my hope is to see one day, and it should be available, that as operators or as engineers, we can walk around the chemical plant with your cell phone you get to the distillation column, it uses the RFID or the near field sensor in the chip, in the camera, or sorry, in the cell phone, detects that I'm in proximity to the distillation column. It shows me the trajectories as a spark line of all temperatures, pressures, flows in that column on my tablet or handheld device in a compact representative way. I can quickly start to see outliers and deviations. As I move across, to a separated unit further down in my process or a tank, it can show me the impeller speeds and other useful information in this compact display. This is why spark lines are, are useful and where they should be used. <coughs> High density graphics on a small size screen. The human eye can pick up up to 600 data points per linear inch. Okay, so 600 individual data points per inch can be shown in, in a spark line. Many websites also now use them um, if, I, if I go here to uh, Google today, um, for example, we go look at the TSX. But let's go look at the financial sector. So XFN.to is a stock that tracks the index for the finance um, sector on the TSX. Google has effectively shown spark lines here for all the stocks that trade in the financial sector on the TSX. I've clicked here on the Y, so now I'm showing data for one year or one month. But very quickly, I can see which stocks trend up, which stocks trend down, which stocks move together. Here's one that moves opposite to the other, okay? And it makes absolute sense. Horizons Beta Pro is a stock that is intentionally traded to be oppositely correlated to the other stocks. So that's good to see that. Look at the other stocks, I can match these trends. I can find stocks or companies which are outliers, which break behavior with their competitors. That can be very useful information. Okay? If I'm looking at a stock and all the stocks are going up, it means that entire sector is going up. So I expect stocks to go up. But if one of them is going down while all the others are going up, I can hang on, that one's weird. There's something to watch out there. Okay? So, spark <coughs> lines, excellent compact representation. Here we're seeing 365 data points approximately for the stock value as traded in this, in this sector. Another form of spark line, although Edward Tufty uh, was the person who championed this, and so if you read that link, uh, that hyperlink up there, 
Uh, you can go read more about his description on the spark line and why, it's, why it is effective. But arguably, we've used these for many years uh, prior to that. If you've ever been into an emergency room or if you've watched enough TV shows with emergency rooms in it, I guess, we see these all the time in the background. Um, doctors and nurses are, are picking out a lot of useful information on the spacing of these, these data points, the correlations between the different electrical probes that are, are in that ECG. So very, very common and effective form of data representation. Indicating to us here the summary I'd like you to take from this is we don't need a y-axis, we don't always need an x-axis, provided the implicit y-axis and the implicit x-axis make sense to the people consuming this information. <coughs> Just a few other guides on making effective time series plots. Sometimes we see, um, especially in newspapers, they, they like to make it look nice. They'll take a plot that looks like this and they'll put a big magnifying glass over it and then they'll redraw part of the plot superimposed on top of here. That can get really messy and take things out of perspective. A better way to do that, if you want to magnify in on a region of the plot, is as shown here in this article, um, in this journal publication, show the original data plot and then below it or to the side, show the zoomed in period. So here we're going on the y axis, x axis from 0 to 80, here we've zoomed in from 0 to 20. So I now know I've got my context above and I've got my detail below. So the context here is four original data points, uh, four original variables. Here I've selected two over a narrow window to get into the detail. That's an effective visualization. So here it's repeated once on the left, left block, and second time on the right for the system. Some other ways uh, to lie with statistics and lie with data are when you do not adjust for inflation. Okay, so we've learned in our other courses that there's a time value of money, that there's inflation, <coughs> things change over time. So it would be a lie to show you the data not accounting for inflation. And companies often do this, politicians often do this. Let's take a look at this example from Duke University, uh, which shows car sales over time. So here would be a plot that shows automotive sales in blue and the cost of living, the CPI index in red. Without that red line, one would think that the car industry is booming. Since the 70s until the 90s, things are going great. We see some interesting trends in that oscillation. We see the up and down cyclical behavior, winter, summer, as the car uh, buying trends change within every season. But really, the red line is showing us cost of living index has also gone up with that at the same time. So really, what has happened to car sales over that period? A far more honest representation of that data would be the following, where we've taken the car sales and divided through by the CPI index and show a normalized value. So now we actually pick out some really interesting phenomena. Two interesting periods are the 1975s and the late early 1980s, where there was this recession that occurred in North America. Very hard to see in the original data. So there at 75, we see a little bit of a widening in the gap between the red and blue line. And we see that more evidently here in the, in the 80s. But it's not very clear. It's not very honest representation of what's going on. By doing this, we're getting far more valuable information and seeing that trend of the recession. We're also seeing that essentially from 85 to 95, the car industry is essentially stagnating. Just the usual up and down oscillations with very little actual growth. So whenever we're dealing with financial data or data that are affected by an external variable that causes the number to change over time, we must take into account that index and normalize for it. And one other tip then is just to give context. So we've spoken a bit about context here in the previous slide. Here we've got some context above and the detail below. Politicians and people who want to manipulate data for the to, to put a spin on a particular topic 
will often show some selected information. So here, the stock price over a three month period going from $10 to $16, wow, well, we can argue with a 60% increase over three months. Right? That looks phenomenal. But once you give it a bit of context, you go out to the left and right a bit, you see that it's not really all that great performance. If I go out even further and look at a six year time frame, I really see that I've only focused in on a very rapid rising period. But then if I take it out to even further still from the 1980s to 2009, and I really should take the stock price out to 2013 now because this is Apple stock. So Apple had this tremendous rise here with the introduction of the iPhone, and, and then they went right up to 700 just a few months ago, and now they're back down to 500. So once you get a bit of context to the data, you see a far more realistic and honest picture of what's going on. So be, be wary of that. When someone's presenting data to you, see if there's context. Ask for more, get some data for more of the history in the past or, or, or more into the forward if it's available. Okay, let's talk a bit about bar plots then. Uh, bar plots are a very effective univariate visualization when we've got categorical data. So here we've got data, I've taken this example of expenses for a hypothetical case where the person has tracked expenses and their dollar value spent over a period of time. So here's the annual expenses for different categories. So we've got a value axis that's a continuous scale from zero, say, up to some large number. It doesn't have to be positive. It can be whatever it is, as long as it's generally a continuous variable. So that's my value axis. And then I've got my categorical axis, the discrete entries, house expenses, car expenses, investments, and so forth that are my categories that I've spent that money in. The usual representation, if you plot this out in Excel or MATLAB or whatever tool, is to have this flip 90 degrees. It will put this axis, the categories, on the horizontal or x-axis, and it will show you your values, the continuous variable, on the y-axis. That's the usual representation. But there's an awkwardness about that plot. When we put the categorical variable on this horizontal axis, you've got to kind of twist your head this way to read the thing. It's really annoying. Sometimes the software will tilt the angle at 45 degrees, but then you get a mess up in the plots. If you often look at it, you can't, it's still hard to read. So a simple way of flipping the plot 90 degrees, you've made it so much easier for the user to consume that information. They can now read the information, those category values, left to right in the usual way, and the horizontal axis, we've got no problem dealing with this value axis on the horizontal scale. Like we're, not, we're not unfamiliar with dealing with that sort of information. There's another enhancement on this plot that's not normally done. Normally, if you plot this information in, the, in a typical software package, it will present the category order to you on this category axis in the order that you've got your data in Excel. And usually you'd have it in alphabetical order. So I'd have car expenses first, and then down at the bottom I'd have personal items. So as a result of that, these bars would just be in whatever order they're, they're appearing. Some would be small, some would be short, but they'd be in a mixed up order. Help the user by ordering your category values from high to low, or whatever is natural in the context that you want to emphasize. So here I would like to emphasize the dollar value spent on certain categories in an annual, pe annual period. So sorting it from high dollar to low dollar values and then presenting my categories on the y-axis and assisting my user to very rapidly find and, and find the information that she or he would like to, to see from that. It's no different than, I mean, if I had just had it in, in a random order, I could still find out which is my top expense and my lowest expense. That's not difficult. But ordering it this way, I can now quickly see the ranking. Whereas if house expense bar appeared up here, and then car expense bar down here, I wouldn't quite be able to make out which the order is that they're ranked, especially if the bar lengths are close to each other. So assisting your user in a way that would help them um, is, 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 is a great thing to do. Okay? So 
It doesn't change the interpretation at all, and if anything, it just enhances the value of the plot too. This sort of plot is exactly what's used at the FASCO. Uh, we'll look at a case study in a few weeks' time where when they're ranking the problems on the plot, and these problems are, are automatically determined by their computer system. So the computer system is going through the databases that are firing this huge amount of data. It goes through that and quickly picks out in an automated way the top problems, and it presents it to the operators in this form. The operators can then go and simply click on that bar and get more details about what that problem is and where it is in the process. So you're really assisting your user tremendously by, by reordering your category axis and putting your category axis in an easy to read horizontal on the, on the traditional Y axis. Another way that uh, bar plots are abused is by showing time series data in a bar plot. So avoid doing this. Here we're seeing quarterly profits shown over time. There's absolutely no need to show that in a bar plot. No need at all. For one, it's incredibly wasteful. We've got all this section down here from zero to 50, 60,000 of ink that's just used that's really not giving any information. The reason why it needs to be there is for a bar plot requires to start at zero because bar plots convey information about area. Area requires some sort of relative baseline and then the natural baseline is a zero. But when you plot in financial data, or time series data, anything that's a trend over time, really that zero is fairly arbitrary. And you're wasting a lot of ink. We'll talk about ink wastage in a minute or in the next class. But a far more effective representation of that is simply taking the same data and plotting it as a time series plot. And you can see the trends easier as well. So when I'm talking about ink wastage, what I'm referring to is the fact that I'm representing the same piece of information multiple times in a redundant manner. So if we look at just a single bar, the left edge, the right edge, that top line over there, that numeric value, all of them represent essentially 85. This height from 0 to 85 on the left and the right, that horizontal line over there, incredibly redundant use of ink. Okay. So it's unnecessary to do that. And far more effective is to use the time series plot. So we'll, I'll, I'll end off by showing this rule of thumb here. The rule of thumb is if you want to plot an effective bar plot like this, or any plot, is to maximize how you use your ink. So the total ink is used to represent the data divided by the total ink on the graph. You really want to maximize that. In other words, make sure that all the ink you use goes to showing data, not going to showing superfluous information. And then I'll leave you with this one. This was from a company that they named Nameless. It definitely qualifies as one of the worst bar plots ever. Um, take a look at it. Write down some bullet points to yourself on why, why I consider that the worst bar plot ever. And consider how you would show that in a far more effective way.